Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. Lesson 12 is titled Esther and Mordecai. It's ready for teaching on December 23 and is part of the series of Sabbath School Lessons, God's Mission, Our Mission. Your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 16. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're coming close to the end of this quarter, this series of lessons on how you would like us and how we can share your love with those about us. And uh, today, people are listening all over the world uh, to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson. And I pray, Lord, that as we listen, that each of us may be blessed, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, not just in the understanding of your word, but in our personal lives as well. And today I'd like to pray for Yutsi Kelman of Guyana in South America, for Mike and Sharon Meyer, for Kili Vector in Kenya, for Veta at the Detroit City Temple and her Sabbath School class. I pray you bless each one of them, and Hazel and Balliston and her sick grandchild, and Carmen Bigby, Bigby, Lord, has a health problem. I pray that you'll be with her and bless her and give her strength and comfort and grace. And Lord, as we open your word now, we pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Let's read that again. Isaiah 49 verse 6. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. One of the most inspiring accounts of cross-cultural ministry in the Bible can be found in the book of Esther. A great deal has been written over the millennia about this book, and to this day, many Jews celebrate the Feast of Purim based on Esther chapter 9, verses 26 to 31. Esther and Mordecai, her cousin, were Jews living in the capital of the Persian Empire, Susa. For whatever reason, unlike other Jews who had returned to Judah, they, along with others, remained in the land of their captivity. Then, through a series of providences, Esther became queen. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. In Esther chapter 2, verse 17. It was in this role that Esther, even if somewhat reluctantly, was able to play a major part in biblical history. In its own unique way, this story shows how God's people, even in foreign environments, can witness for truth. Whatever your time allows, read or skim through the book of Esther for this week's study. Sunday, December 17. Captive in a Foreign Culture It is never easy to be expatriated to a foreign culture. It may be difficult for us today to comprehend what the Jews faced, first under the Babylonians and then the Persians. None of us, for instance, lives in an Adventist country where the principles of our faith are, to some degree, the law of the land. But before being deported, the Jewish people had been living in their own country where the principles of their faith were also enshrined in the law of the land. On one level, think how easy that should have made it to be faithful to God. After all, how much easier would it be to keep the seventh-day Sabbath if, in fact, keeping the seventh-day Sabbath were enshrined in the legal codes of the nation? On the other hand, sacred history has shown us that whatever the decrees of the land happen to be, even if favourable to faith, faithfulness must stem from the heart, from within, or else sin, apostasy and ruin will surely follow. As it says in Isaiah 29.13, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honour me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. 
In contrast, for those who are determined to be faithful, even the most unfavourable environment cannot keep them from obedience, as we read in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, and chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, and chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. However unique its situation, what do these accounts reveal about the challenges God's people can face living in a foreign culture? Daniel 1, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He called Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favour and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear, my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you should endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was sixty cubits, and its width six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counsellors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psalter, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And then Daniel chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would not suffer loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counsellors and advisers have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed and according to the law of the Medes and Persians which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. No matter who we are or where we live, we are immersed in an environment that to some degree, either by laws themselves or by the culture or both, can be greatly challenging to our faith and our witness. These accounts in Daniel, though always ending happily, reveal that even under trying circumstances, people can stay faithful to God. Even if none of these accounts had turned out well, there's no doubt these men still did the right thing. And so to finish today, what are some of the challenges to your faith that you face in your own culture? How do you respond to them? Monday, December 18, in a foreign court. Eventually, after the fall of Babylon and the rise of Medo-Persia, many of the Jews returned to their ancestral lands, but not all returned. Some remained where they had been living for a generation or more. With this background in mind, we have a bit of the context for the story of Esther. Esther 1 verse 2 reads, In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel. Here is where the biblical narrative unfolds the Persian Empire under this king. In chapter 1, Queen Vashti falls out of favour with the king, which leads him to look for another queen, one to replace the now disfavoured Vashti. It's in this context that Esther and her cousin Mordecai first appear. Read Esther chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. What do these verses teach us about the situation of Mordecai and Esther? Esther, chapter 2, verse 1. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants, who attended him, said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters, under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. 
In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jaya, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So it was, when the king's command and decree was heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favour, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. Then seven wise maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. It seems that Mordecai, as a royal officer, was sitting at the gate of the palace and was residing in the city of Shushan with his adopted daughter or cousin Esther. Because of their position and living where they did, they were immersed in the Persian culture. This must be at least part of the reason Esther was chosen to be presented to the king. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem, we read in verse 8. Read chapter 2, verses 10 and 20. What was going on here, and why would Mordecai give her such a command? Esther chapter 2, verse 10, Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And verse 20, now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. Though the text does not say precisely why, it's not hard to guess. As aliens in a foreign culture and religion that we will see could be hostile, they were wise in keeping silent about their family and people. And so to finish today, what circumstances might you think of where it could be prudent not to be overt about our faith? Or should we never do that? And if not, why not? Tuesday, December 19, Mordecai's Faithful Witness Living as they were in a foreign land, sooner or later Mordecai and Esther, if they were to remain faithful to God, might have run into trouble. This certainly became the case for Mordecai. Read Esther chapter 3 verses 1 to 15. What happened here and why? Esther 3 beginning at verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened, when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman, to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast per, that is, the lot, before Haman, to determine the day and the month, until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. 
Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded, to the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus it was written, and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions." A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. In Esther chapter 3, we learn that King Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, honoured Haman and gave him a high position full of power. Everyone was told they must bow down before Haman. But we read in verse 2, Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. The Bible does not give the reason that Mordecai did not kneel before this man, but we know why he is a faithful Jew. Mordecai is not willing to pay homage to a descendant of Agag an Amalekite, enemy of his people, since the Exodus, as we read in Deuteronomy 25, verse 19. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. How could a faithful Jew kneel down before an Amalekite? or, for that matter, worship anyone but the Lord. Verse 3 reads, Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Though we don't know in detail how he responded, the next verse 4 says that Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Surely in that response, Mordecai had an opportunity to explain that as a worshipper of the God who created the heavens and the earth, he could not worship any sinful human being. No doubt Mordecai was to some degree able to witness about his faith, a faith that he adhered to so strongly that it endangered himself and unfortunately others. Ellen White writes in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of May 13, 1884, From Daniel and his companions and Mordecai, a bright light shone amid the moral darkness of the kingly courts of Babylon. End of quote. Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people, describing them as a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws, in verse 8. A people whose customs are different and who do not obey the king's laws? A perfect recipe for persecution. And so to finish today, what are ways, even now, that we might be tested as was Mordecai? How should we respond?
Wednesday, December 20, for such a time as this. Read Esther chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. Why was it considered at this moment appropriate for Esther to identify herself as a Jew? So let's begin in Esther chapter 4 and verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathash, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathach returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to the king these thirty days." So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. When Mordecai contacted Esther for her help, she had been married to Ahasuerus for several years, but there was a law in Persia that no one could come to the king's throne without an express invitation from the king. Anyone who didn't respect this rule risked death. Esther, knowing the risk, went to the throne room anyway, uninvited. Mordecai's faith sought to awaken Esther's faith. The heart of the book of Esther is found in Mordecai's words to Esther, and it comes from verses 13 and 14. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther's faith was put to the test as Mordecai appealed to her love for her people. No one knew she was Jewish except Mordecai, and once she made the decision to become involved, she did not hesitate to put her life on the line. Her faith in God was strong, and she knew that without God's help, she could not succeed. Her answer to Mordecai revealed her faith. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther 4 verse 16. Mordecai sent this information to the entire Jewish community in Shushan, or Susa. And while they fasted and prayed, 
Esther prepared herself for the dangerous moment. As it says in Esther 5 verses 1 and 2, On the third day Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace, in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And to finish today, for the Jews in such a situation as described above, prayer would certainly accompany fasting. That is, though they acted in their own behalf, prayer was central to their response. What obvious lesson can we take from this? Thursday, December 21, The Miracle of Purim Commentators for millennia have noticed that God's name does not appear in the book of Esther. This is the only biblical book where such a phenomenon occurs. However, the Jews were able to recognize God's actions in the great deliverance made for them, and this book was selected by God's people to be included in the canon of the Bible. Are we able to discover the presence of God beneath the surface of our daily life? God's actions can take the appearance of normal, natural events, and if we don't pay careful attention to them, we will not notice God's presence. Read Esther chapter 9, verses 1 to 12. What was the result of Esther's effort? Esther chapter 9 verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could withstand them, because fear of them fell upon all people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work, helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed five hundred men. Also, Parshandatha, Delphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashtha, Arasai, Aridai, and Vajasatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan, the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Or what is your further request? It shall be done. The miracle of Purim takes a very unusual form. The miracle is hidden, disguised in apparently natural events. The law to destroy the Jews was not reversed, but a new law was written, allowing the Jews to defend themselves. Also notice what else had happened and how God was able to work through these events. The Persians noticed God's actions on behalf of the Jews. And the result? Many people of other nationalities became Jews, we read in Esther 8.17. This is a great example of how the Lord was able to work to bring lost souls to a knowledge of Him. The leaders of the Jewish people recognized the working of God. 
When the Jews were victorious in defending themselves, they declared a yearly time, called Purim, in remembrance and celebration of their victory. These days are still traditionally spent in thanksgiving to God in remembrance of His deliverance. And that brings us to the end of today's reading with challenge. Pray that God will give you the courage to share something He has done for you with one of the people on your prayer list this week. And challenge up, begin a diary or journal of special little things or big things that God does for you. Review it and pray that God will bring these things to your mind at just the right time so you can share them with someone. Friday, December 22. To every household and every school, Ellen White writes in Education, page 263, to every parent, teacher and child upon whom has shone the light of the gospel, comes at this crisis the question put to Esther the Queen at that momentous crisis in Israel's history. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther 4, verse 14. And then from... Daughters of God, pages 45 and 46. Esther was a beautiful Jewish girl, cousin of Mordecai, who took her into his home after her parents died and loved her as his own daughter. God used her to save the Jewish people in the land of Persia. Note, this second paragraph above is introductory material included about Esther in Daughters of God on page 45 and was not written by Ellen White. However, the two subsequent quotations below were written by her, and we continue. In ancient times, the Lord worked in a wonderful way through consecrated women who united in his work with men whom he had chosen to stand as his representatives. He used women to gain great and decisive victories. More than once in times of emergency, he brought them to the front and worked through them for the salvation of many lives. Through Esther the Queen, the Lord accomplished a mighty deliverance for his people. At a time when it seemed that no power could save them, Esther and the women associated with her, by fasting and prayer and prompt action, met the issue and brought salvation to their people. A study of women's work in connection with the cause of God in the Old Testament times will teach us lessons that will enable us to meet emergencies in the work today. We may not be brought into such a critical and prominent place as were the people of God in the time of Esther, but often converted women can act an important part in more humble positions. Yes, many have been doing and are still ready to do. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, the book of Esther does leave us with some unanswered questions, particularly concerning Esther's role in the court of the king. Even though she was elevated to the role of queen, how do we reconcile these things with her faith, or can we? Two, the famous words of Esther and if I perish, I perish, from Esther 4.16, have echoed down through the millennia as an example of faithfulness even in the face of death. How do her words reflect what God's people will face in the last days when the issues in Revelation 13 become a reality? And three, in class, go over the question at the end of Monday's study about not revealing your faith at times. Should that ever be the case for us? Dreaming Dreams Part 2 by Andrew McChesney Since childhood, Joseph Delamu had gone to church daily and following his father's example, knelt before images. But he had a vivid dream when he asked God if he was going to the right church. He sensed that God was calling him to leave his father's church. So, 16-year-old Joseph joined another church in Conakry, capital of the French-speaking country of Guinea in West Africa. He soon became its youth leader and he organised numerous outreach programs. Several years passed and Joseph's father grew increasingly displeased with his son for going to another church. I want you to learn English, he said. 
you need to give up your church activities and focus on English. Joseph was reluctant to stop going to church, but to make Father happy, he quit the outreach programs and enrolled in English lessons at the age of 23. The English teacher, fortunate Caleb B. Laurie, opened the first lesson with the words, Let's pray. Joseph was astonished. He had thought that he was giving up God to learn English, but the teacher prayed at every lesson. Three weeks into the lessons, the teacher asked Joseph for help. I have many papers to grade, Fortunate said. Please, could you stay and help? After grading the papers, Fortunate invited Joseph to study the Bible with him. Joseph was pleased. He thought, God is following me everywhere. But the Bible study left him confused. He had left his father's church to join another church. But now he was hearing new Bible teachings that seemed to lead to Fortunate's church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is because of my father, Joseph told himself bitterly. If he hadn't sent me to these lessons, I wouldn't have these problems. He continued Bible studies for two months and then went to his pastor for advice. He wanted to know which church was right. The pastor dismissed the Adventists as incorrect. Don't listen to them, he said. Joseph asked for a meeting with the pastor and fortunate to discuss the Bible. The pastor refused to come and sent representatives. When the representatives failed to support their views from the Bible, the pastor demanded a second meeting. But again, he sent representatives whose answers didn't satisfy Joseph. Joseph decided to pray and fast for three days about what to do. And then he had another dream. The 13th Sabbath offering on December 30 will help spread the gospel in the West Central Africa division, which includes Guinea. Thank you for planning a generous offering. We will read more about Joseph and Fortunate next week. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.